Welcome to episode 40 of the Page One Podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco and thanks for joining us for this episode. If this is your first episode of the Page One Podcast, uh, at the Page One Podcast we like to speak to writers of all kinds, uh, authors, screenwriters, video game writers, comics writers, to try and find out about their writing process, how they broke into the industry and get as many hints and tips as possible. And we've had some great guests in the past. Uh, last week's episode was a good one with Joe Cornish, the yeah, director, great. one half of Adam and Joe, of course. And uh, yeah, there's many great guests going back. So do check out the past episodes if you haven't heard of us before. But this week, we've got another great guest, Tarek. We do have another great guest. This week, we are chatting with David Quantic who uh, you might know him from his work on NME when he was writing for them. He was a journalist for a number of years. He then moved into the TV world uh, with uh, some fairly heavy hitters. Uh, Chris Morris, he worked on with a lot, with the kind of brass eye. Yeah. Uh, then Armando Iannucci, you worked with him on uh, The Thick of It and then later on Veep. Mm-hmm. And uh, he actually revealed to us he's also been doing some work recently on... Avenue what, Five. On Avenue Five. That's even. right. Yeah. Uh, and very exciting. Yeah, and he won an Emmy for his work on Veep as well. And we chat to him about the Emmy. In fact, we even got to see it. So you'll hear we, us we virtually held it. Basically. Yeah. You'll hear us talking about something that you can't see, which I'm sure makes great podcast <laughs> great fodder. Video, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but no, it's a really fun chat with David. He's a really funny guy, and also a lot of good practical advice in it as well yeah. i think because he has written books as well he's, he's a number of books he's had uh, he has including his most recent one is night train which i think it's officially out on the 25th of august but you can get it on audible and i think as an ebook just now already certainly you can get it on audible because i've listened to it on audible um and it's it's definitely worth checking out it's not what you would expect maybe from someone that's written veep and the thick of it yes in that yes, it's not absolutely. a straight it's it, it's not a straight comedy. It's sort of horror. There is an element of sort of absurdity about it as well, mm-hmm. I would say. But um, it's it's a difficult one to classify. But it's definitely worth checking out. It's it's sort of linked to if you've seen this film Snowpiercer, this sort of train that's that's traveling and you don't know what's happening and why why the train is there and things like that. It's a, it's all a bit of a mystery that gets revealed chapter after chapter as they go through the carriages. And of course, the fact that it's out an ebook and not a paperback is just another reason why ebooks are better. <laughs> yeah, Tarek, if, <laughs> if, you, if this is your first episode, Tarek always has a thing about uh, ebooks over real books. We always this ask is the hill I will die on. If we always ask our guests what they prefer, and very, very few of them pick ebook, which annoys Tarek. But anyway, we're rambling on too much here. We'll get straight on to the podcast, and we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat about the podcast and to let you know about next week's guest, which is another great one. So uh, we'll just get on with it. See you then. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made page one. Page one is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, 
whether you want to write a book, a screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. I started off, there was a magazine called City Limits okay. in London, which was kind of a left-wing alternative to sit to time out. And I wrote a story. It was a parody of a detective novel. It was meant to be comedy. And City Limits printed it, and then they didn't want any more stories from me. <laughs> so they gave some book reviews, uh, which was a bit weird because I'd never reviewed anything. And then I sort of moved on to writing music reviews, and then I sent a letter to the enemy and got a job freelancing for them. So, yeah, City Limits was the f so the first thing I did was a false start that looped around because the first thing I ever had printed for money was a short story, <clears throat> which uh -huh. is a bit odd because I didn't write any more short stories. Until <laughs> <laughs> and was that – had you always, when you were growing up, always wanted to get into the world of writing? Was that always the ambition? Well, no, the thing that I always say is that I didn't I didn't know that I wanted to be a writer because I didn't think it was possible mm -hmm. to be a writer. I don't know why, because I had lots of books. But it was like that thing that people used to say about punk. I didn't know I could be in a band. So I didn't know I could be a writer. Mm -hmm. But I was always writing. But, you know, like people are doodling. Mm -hmm. Just because you write on a piece of paper and draw a dog doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to make be a professional artist. <laughs> and I used to write like loads of people do, you know. I used to write stories and scraps of things and parodies. Tried to write <clears throat> novels and things like that, but you just abandon it. You're like, oh, well, there's the thing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until, you know, even when I wrote to the enemy, I basically wrote a letter slagging them off. It was obviously a passive aggressive, look at me, I want some work letter. And they gave me some work. <clears throat> I don't think I could have asked for a job normally. I think I had to just be irritating and <laughs> do that. So when I got and then it was like, oh, I've been given, I'm going to get paid for writing about records. And then after that, it was like, well, I can do anything now. Mm -hmm. So so how long did you spend writing for NME then? Um, from 1983 until about 1996, because nice. I couldn't get out. I had this thing <laughs> everyone did in the 80s. It's like, you can't be a music journalist when you're 30, which is ironic like, because all the music journalists in the world are over 50 now. But then it was like, no, you can't. It's like being in a band. Yeah. So I always wanted to get out. I was always trying to get things on comedy shows, and I couldn't do it. You know, I, at one point I thought I'm going to die at the enemy, <laughs> <laughs> literally. And uh, but you did eventually manage to to do to break out and and get work, radio work and TV work. I think. I mean, how did how did that stuff come about? Well, that was weird because I sent sketches to people. <clears throat> I sent something to Spit in Image in about 1987, and they. I sent three sketches and they bought one of them. And then I couldn't write everything else I wrote, got rejected because I didn't know how to write sketches. It's like I'd accidentally written a sketch that worked. And then I was getting nowhere with this. And it was very annoying. And then by one of those brilliant moments, I had a call in the NME with Stephen Wells, who was a brilliant, brilliant person and writer now sadly deceased. And Armando Iannucci saw it, and I still have the letter, and it's basically, hi, I'm starting a new show, and it would be great if you could send us some stuff. And so me <laughs> wow. and Stephen, yeah, and I've told this story too many times, which is what people always say, and everyone's like, I've never heard this story. <laughs> so me and Stephen went to a meeting, and it was Armando Iannucci, Chris Morris, Steve Coogan, David Schneider, Herring and Lee, um, Patrick Marber, and I literally thought, these people are all losers. I'm going to be the yeah. famous one out of this one. And just <laughs> like the rest happened of my to life, these people yeah. ground into my face. Yeah, there was like three three future Oscar nominees in that room. I mean, that's... It was insane. Yeah. Peter Bainham, oh, he was there. Yeah, and me and Stephen worked on On The Hour. And that was it. And I'd kind of, you know, all that effort to try to be a comedy writer. And all I had to do was write a column in The Enemy. And, you know, I'm working for Armando literally now. I got an email this morning saying that they want me to do some jokes on Avenue 5. So oh, wow. I would definitely, I probably would have died at the enemy without Armando Iannucci. <laughs> it's a horrible thought for everyone. <laughs> so it, it sounds like th that work came about. You know, normally if people are wanting to get into 
TV writing or something like that, then they would have an agent and you know go through it and that go through that process. But it sounds like that that wasn't the process for you. It came more about through your journalistic career. Yeah, I mean, I don't regret it. But one thing is that all the people who I know through work didn't do this. You know, I think Graham Linehan had done some music journalism beforehand and Stuart Lee did later. But very few of us had a job until we were 30. I mean, Peter Bainham, brilliantly, had been a merchant seaman before he became a comedy writer. And most people... Most people think it's still 1969 and you are Michael Palin and you go to Oxbridge and meet a writing partner, then do a BBC radio sketch show, then get a TV show and all that kind of thing. And that wasn't my route. And I don't think it is a route for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I definitely recommend having a job first. Otherwise, you just write sitcoms about two men who share a flat <laughs> and just trying to get a girlfriend. I mean, it sounds like it must have been quite a, quite a leap from NME into writing the the kind of sketch stuff and 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 was it quite a trial by fire did you learn a lot very very quickly i didn't learn anything really um the thing about enemy at this point was that it was a weird place because it was a now we'd call it a youth we'd call it a cultural magazine or something weird because it wrote about rock music but we had to fill you know whatever 100 pages every week and there just wasn't you know bands just weren't doing enough mm -hmm. so you You'd write filler. You'd write. You'd make stuff up. I used to do the. Go I used to be the gossip section editor, and I used to make it up because there wasn't enough. So you do creative writing that way. There'd be a front <laughs> section thing where you'd write little stuff, and I used to. I, first of all, I used to. I used to get bored, and I used to review records in different styles because I love parodies. Mm -hmm. So I'd write. I don't know. A Flan O'Brien. I once did the gossip column in the style of Flan O'Brien. That went down really well. <laughs> I wrote it in the style of one of his characters and got called a racist for trying to be <laughs> Irish. So, that wasn't good. but yeah, and in in this front of section, we used to just write comedy pieces. <clears throat> you know, later on, I worked with Stuart McConey and Andrew Collins, and they did a thing called Thrills, Believe It or Not, where they made up lies. And they, you know, they started the urban myth that Bob Holness from Blockbusters played saxophone on Baker Street, which <laughs> then, which turns up as an official fact if someone mentions Bob Holness. <laughs> So there was a lot, it was a great place to learn to write. And it wasn't just, at that point, it wasn't just music. You know, I would go out and interview authors and film directors. Mm -hmm. And when I started really wanting to be a writer, I'd go, you know, I went and interviewed Paul Whitehouse and Charlie Higson. And because I'd done some comedy, Charlie Higson ended up asking me if I wanted to send him some jokes. And that, to me, my attitude of writing has always been like, do you know Billy Lyre, the book or the film? No, no, no I don't know. Billy Lyre is a really important book to me and a lot of people at my age because it's about various things in it. One of the things in it is that Billy, the main character, is a loser and a dreamer, but he sent some jokes to a comedian called Danny Boone who writes him a letter referred to by all comedy fans as the Danny Boone letter saying, really enjoyed your stuff. If you're ever in London, we should meet up, which he takes as meaning that he's made it and he's now a writer. Yeah. And, of course, in Billy Lyre, he never does go to London. It's one of the sad things. But that's how I thought comedy worked, that it was a bit like Tin Pan Alley in the old days. Hey, you've got a great tune, kid. We'll go together, you know. Yeah. Whereas, in fact, it's a relentlessly dull and grinding process of <laughs> trying to get somewhere. And you get a joke on the radio and you think that's it, but then you die. Yeah. <laughs> that's my story then with someone dying. I suppose the work of enemy was was good in the sense as well that it would teach you how to hit, hit a deadline and the importance of turning work in on time uh, a certain length you know those types of things which you would move on and take with you no matter where you're working absolutely there are two things i want to say about this one fuck off douglas adams there's a famous douglas adams quote i keep <laughs> hearing which is like i love deadlines i love the sound they make as they whoosh by it's like fuck off you <laughs> idle fucking language cambridge tosser oh do you love it that's probably because you've got someone fucking filling your mouth with diamonds instead of going to work it's like he was a great talent douglas adams sorely missed love his work but <laughs> deadlines are brilliant and maybe he'd have written a bit more if he cared about deadlines. Deadlines are fantastic. Deadlines concentrate the mind. Deadlines are like, now I've got to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm working for a music magazine. Um, say it comes out every Wednesday, whether you want it to or not. 
and having to write, you know, up to 3,000 words sometimes, interviewing bands overnight, all that kind of thing. It was incredibly good discipline. And I loved it. It's like <clears throat> I used to have little races with myself. Could I review 60 singles for the singles page in an hour? Yep, it can be done. Could I review an album without listening to it? Absolutely. <laughs> all that kind of thing. All those little enemy things. Could I make up the entire letters page? <laughs> yeah, all that thing. And it, so it's now when I work on a show, a friend of mine said, a writer called Jeff Dean said about me once that I may not be funny, but I am fast. And I learned that from the music papers. And, you know, I am definitely a very, working with people on <clears throat> on shows like Veep, I've learned that I'm not the only fast person in the world. But being fast is a really useful skill. I never understand it when people go, he sat down and looked out of the, just like window. You always come back to it. I've worked with people on sketch shows when they've literally savoured every word in a line. And... and I've had to claw my own eyes out just to keep myself awake. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I learned I learned speed from being a music journalist, and I'm very glad that I did. And did it also? I read in one of your interviews you said that you know coming up with ideas for uh, particularly, I think, sort of newspaper or magazine work and stuff can be a challenge sometimes, especially if it's something like the enemy that's coming out every week, like you say. Um, but that you can train yourself to be to generate ideas and to be a sort of ideas machine um i just wondered if you could expand a bit on that on that idea yeah it's it's pattern recognition is that everything everything that comes into your head unless you're in a coma is an idea and the trick is like you know when people used to go panning for gold they get a big sieve and they pick up some earth in a river and they'd look at it and then after a while, you get to notice the little bits of gold. Mm -hmm. It's quite a metaphor. You know, most people go, oh, a load of earth. And it's the same with ideas. You're walking down the street and you're like, you know, no, 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 I'll buy some chips later on. It's like, that woman looks like a tiny ant. My God, what if that? What, what if tiny ants would disguise themselves as women? That's a terrible idea. Move on. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, the trick is to learn, teach yourself to spot ideas. Mm -hmm. That everything's just flowing through your head all the time, like a stream of, random nonsense that's what thought is and you just stop <clears throat> so i went out to meet a bloke called malcolm emery who'd worked for city limits and he's a translator now we're having a chat and while we're talking about translation and the things that I, I just i suddenly thought what if somebody translated something what if a translator translated a book into a different language and changed it so much that it became a better book and I wrote a film script about that. And the story that I always tell, again, I've never heard this, is that, you know, I was walking the dog once and my mind was flowing freely and I was thinking about Star Wars because I don't like Star Wars. And I was thinking of a way of describing it in a way that was as contemptuous as possible, <laughs> but also in a way that contained, that made it quite hard to work out what the film was. And I started just saying things like, it's a film about, a space hairdresser who's got a tin foil pal and his and a best mate's a pedal bin. And I was just doing this rant in my head and it was just quite revolting. He's fucked his sister and all this <laughs> and Lego. They're all made of Lego. And then I was writing with the thick of it. And Armando gave us a brief. He said, we have to do a speech for Malcolm Tucker. And in this speech, he has to explain to Ollie who's a young, nerdy guy, he has to explain his plan to him in a way that Ollie will understand. <laughs> so I just thought, what if he explained it using Star Wars? And because he's Malcolm Tucker and he's horrible, what if he uses Ollie's favourite film <laughs> to set it up? And it was the greatest moment of my life. I, I went to the read-through and Peter Capaldi and Chris Addison were reading it and they were laughing as they read it. And I would say, you know, I, probably, I think I just said I've never been so happy in my life, but another time I've never been. And it's on YouTube. And I, you know, I probably shouldn't say, oh, I wrote this special bit of the show because the rest of the show is a million times better. But that was just an idea I had. That's what I mean about training it. Like you, you have an idea. It's yeah. like, oh, I hate Star Wars. Oh, there we go. And I'm like, well, what if I had to describe it? So anything that comes into your head, if it strikes you as odd or unusual, I guess you freeze frame it and look at it for a minute and just go like, oh, is that something? 
or if you're not, chuck it back in. But training your mind, yeah, I sound a bit like a self-help book, but train your mind to spot <laughs> ideas. Because you know, everyone's got millions of ideas all the time. Anybody who just looks down at their shoe and go, wouldn't it be funny if X, Y, or Z happened? Because mm-hmm. all ideas are just what if. Mm-hmm. And then, so, so how did you get involved in the thick of it then? Was that obviously you were kind of in the room with Armando Inucci, etc., at that point early on? And was that was that what led to the the job and the, the thick of it? Well, the thing with Armando is he reminds me of a lot of sort of long-established rock artists, people like Madonna, David Bowie, and what they do is that even though a lot of time is passing and fashions are changing, they surround themselves with new producers or DJs or whatever, so that, you know, they keep doing... And what Armando does is brilliant, is that every show he does, he brings in a load of new people on Avenue 5, Marina Hyde writing for it, Daisy, the Coopers, who did um, my con- uh, This Country, are working on it. So he's always new people. So on the last series of The Thick of It, I didn't work with him for him, whatever, for a long time. And it was the final series of The Thick of It. And I think he'd used the same writers on it for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I think he wanted it to be a bit fresher. So I just got asked to do it for a couple of episodes on that. And that was astonishingly fortunate, A, because I got to work on The Thick of It, which is one of the best shows ever made. But B, he was also putting together Veep at the same time. <clears throat> so a lot of us who'd worked only on the last series of The Thick of It got taken on to do Veep as well, which is astonishing and to have that good luck. And when you're writing for something like The Thick of It or Veep, um, you know, how, how you know you hear things about uh, writers' rooms and things like that, how how does that work? Like, does does someone say right? This is what this is the basic idea of what's going to happen in this episode. Does one of the writers take the lead on sort of try to structure it, and the others come up with sort of funny bits to put in, or you know what is what is the process there? Well, I can only talk about Veep because that's the only show I've worked on with it, apart from um, TV Burp. All right, so TV Burp, I'll do that one first. That was really simple. We'd all get sent videos or DVDs. We'd all watch the DVDs. We'd all come in, the five writers, with Harry. He'd show us a load of clips. Uh, we'd show him our clips. He'd write down all the ones he liked and write a script. With Veep, basically, Armando would have, and a couple of other senior writers, like Simon Blackwell, maybe Tony Roach, would sit down and they plan the rough series. In this series of Veep, the vice president is running for office. She accidentally becomes president at the end, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, they then expand these into episodes, then they'd call a meeting and all the writers would come in and discuss these ideas even further and go away, then Armando would go away again and then produce some synopses and then they'd hand out episodes. Um, So generally pairs of writers would write those. Then once those episodes were written, then it's just mad. They'd all be swapped around and everybody else would do a rewrite on someone else's script. Oh, right. So, yeah, and it's a brilliant system we call it it's alts alts the phrase is like you know can you do alts on this and it's a brilliant system because it means you're constantly rewriting and rewriting mm. or sometimes you get a script you're like didn't i just write that <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, it's a fantastic system it just really belt and braces ensures that it's so it's a pyramid system he said making a pyramid mm. show Mando with a couple of writers then comes down trickles down and but everyone's involved in the process there's by and large you know meetings where People can chip in extra ideas, suggest episode ideas and stuff like that. But it's always interesting doing stuff with Armando because generally he's got a central idea and you're not sure what it is yet. But then suddenly you go, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. So the, the, episode, the series of Veep where she became president is still, to me, astonishingly audacious. It's like, wow. Yeah, no, the, the, well, the thing, as you said, the thick of it and Veep are both up there with the best TV comedies that there have been so to have worked on those is is incredible I suppose what I was what I was wondering about the writers room before it was you know if you've got an idea and then the rest of the writers or the other writers reject it and move on some to some say something else is better and stuff that could be something that's a bit hard to take sometimes I suppose but on in that process if it's constantly getting rewritten by the time you see it again, 
that 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 seems like a gentler way of dealing with that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, and also don't forget that writers' room isn't led by writers. It's you know, writers' room is led by the showrunner or producer mm. or whatever. Mm. So again, with my metaphor about Armando being David Bowie, you know, everyone sits around and contributes ideas to the song, but in the end, it's like the David Bowie who goes, "Let's do this" or "Let's do that." Yeah. And the thing is, it's good because it is you're work you're working for a common goal, which is the show. And the show isn't a vehicle for Peter Capaldi or Julia Louis Dreyfus. The show is a vehicle for itself. Mm-hmm. It's putting across a point of view and it has its own sense of humor. You know, and there's loads of times you've come up with a great joke and it's just for the wrong show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's loads of times you come up with a great idea and it's for the wrong show. I mean, when, when On the Hour started, me and Stephen Wells couldn't really want to write Alan Partridge, but we could never, we didn't know what the tone was, you know, because it hadn't been on the radio yet. Yeah. So, so I suppose yeah. as, a, as a writer on a, on a, on a TV show, you're, you're, it sounds like you're almost in service to something. It's, it's not your work. You're kind of feeding the beast. And, it, and, and, and if, if you submit a script and you get an alt back and your joke's been smoothed out or taken away, it's not a personal thing. It's just a... It didn't fit the the tone of the show, and and that's what's always got to be the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, it's not about the thing about being a writer is, if you want to be a star, it's the wrong job. Mm-hmm. You know, writers are on an equal footing with makeup artists and cameramen, mm-hmm. um, and there's not, that's nothing wrong with that. That's why they put the writers' BAFTA along with the Craft Awards. The writers get very upset because they think they make the show. You know, so every I have friends and quite rightly say, you know oh, such and such a show's on, but they haven't credited the writers on Twitter. Well, you know, no one cares who the writers are, apart from people like us. No one cares who the writer is. They care who the star is, and mm-hmm. they care what the show's about. Nobody wants to know that X person doesn't write all their jokes. People turn on the telly, they th- they, they half, they slightly think Mrs. Brown is real. They definitely think that <laughs> the bag is real, and so on and so forth. They pretty much, I think, even... Even me, I think that when I turn on the telly, Phoebe Waller-Bridge has just walked into a room and there's a camera on and she's talking to it. Yeah, yeah. Writers are, we're not unimportant. We are writers, but we do go on about ourselves too much. Oh, you know, the show wouldn't be anything without me. Yes, it would, because they get someone else in. It's like an ant going, oh, you know, if it wasn't for me, that leaf would fall over. And on that on that point that you touched on there, which was that, you know, you, you can have an idea or a joke that doesn't fit that particular project you are someone that seems to work on multiple things at a time uh, multiple different types of projects and things like that which does that allow you you know if some if if something isn't going to work for that particular project you it's quite easy for you to pivot and try and put it in something else yeah you know instead of forcing your foot into a shoe it's like going around and see if you can Make a better shoe. Mm. Oh, it's a terrible metaphor. But yeah, if I've got, it's like I wrote a book called All My Colours and I'd had an idea for a man who thinks about a book that no one else has heard of. And it's like, and I've done it for a friend of mine. And it's like, I just suddenly, somebody said, this sounds like a book. I'm like, yeah. And then I thought, it's a horror novel. I'd never written a horror novel. I didn't have a lot of interest in horror at the time. But it's the only way it worked, was it? So I wrote a horror novel. Mm hmm. You know, rather than try and make it into a sketch or yeah. into a sitcom or a comedy film, <clears throat> none of those things work for it. Um, the whole point of the things that I've written about writing, how to write everything and all that kind of thing, is that writing is a great big C and you should dip into it and do different things with it. You know, saying you're a, we all label things. I constantly read interviews with science fiction writers who are really up in arms because everyone just says, oh, you're a genre writer. It's like, no, there's some brilliant science fiction books. Yeah, but, you know, just you'd have to get over it slightly. People like to know what's going on. That said, if you've got an idea for a comedy and normally you write drama, you know, then obviously you should do it and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So it's great. Every I, I write down all my ideas, you know, on my phone or whatever or by the bed and all that. And look in the morning, I look at him and he says something like, Antelope query section twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a music? And so on and so forth. But and I every month I put a short story on my website because that's a great way of dealing with ideas. You know, even if the story doesn't work, you've made you've done something with the idea, you can come back to it later. But but it's funny because other people we've spoken to uh, 
particularly actually crime writers in particular um seem to be very res- restricted in what they write in in terms of you know if they want to write a different type of story if they don't want to write the next crime novel they want to write a science fiction novel a horror novel whatever um Th- their agent will often say to them, "Well, if you want to do that, you'll have to change your name, or you know, use your initials, or something like that." It seems I, d- I don't know if it's just because you're someone that has worked on so many projects that you have that freedom, but in other areas of the writing world, it seems that some people do feel that sort of restriction that they can't branch out as easily sometimes. Yeah, and I understand that. Um... And it's very difficult, but that's kind of the way things are. It's like if you go into a bookshop, it's not like A here and Z yeah, here and every yeah. book in there. You go into, and I always argue that it's kind of helpful. It's like, I want a crime novel. That's how most people think. I want a book that's like J.K. Rowling, or I want a book that's like Martin Amis. Mm-hmm. And there's a section, you know, and it's called Books like, books That You Like. <laughs> and it's science, science fiction or fantasy or whatever. Yeah. When you go to the main fiction section, it's a free for. I mean, I'd love to write under a pseudonym because I have different kinds of book, and it's like I worry about getting them out. And I was, you know, you will salute the genius of Ian Banks who wrote science fiction as Ian M. Banks. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I wonder if it's the same person. <laughs> <laughs> and and your you in 2016 was the Mule. That was your first novel that wasn't that was a fiction novel. Um, and was writing a novel something you'd always wanted to do? Is there something you'd always yeah. wanted to? I had been trying, I think every decade I tried to write a novel or did write a novel. Um, and they were either no good or I didn't finish them. Then I wrote a comedy novel called Sparks around the start of the decade, <clears throat> the 2000s. And that was like one where I had an agent who liked it and then he didn't. And then some. Then some. Then my wife said, "Oh, look, you can put novels online and make money. So it's an e-novel. It makes literally about a pound a week, which is fine. It's been up for ages now, so I probably made a million pounds. <laughs> but yeah, that was always a thing. Of con- I'd always really wanted to write novels, but again, it was confidence. You know, I can't. Really- and it was a lot of effort. It takes ages to write a novel. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes weeks. So that was the thing where, and it was like I'm going to do all this to get rejected, and then it was like. I'd done Sparks, and some some people had been nice about it, and Neil Gaiman said he was reading it and he liked it, which was amazing. So when I did The Mule and got it crowdfunded, that got some good reviews, and it's like, wow. And it's that sort of making things, objectifying it. It's like, okay, this isn't just something I've written. It's a mess of words. A person in a newspaper who may be mad liked it, and another mm-hmm. person. So it might actually be a real – it's not whether it's good or not. Is it, is it a real book? So when I'd done The Mule and got reviews and that kind of thing, even though it didn't sell, then I was just like, good, I can write books now. And that's what I've been doing since. Mm-hmm. It was like a mad outpouring of writing books. I've got loads of unpublished books because it's like, I can do this and I'm trying to catch up for lost time. So how did the crowdfunding part work? Did you did you raise the money so you could you, you put the book out yourself? I had written the book, couldn't get a publisher. An agent I spoke to said, you should try Unbound. <clears throat> Unbound. Oh, okay. So I went to them, and I had enough friends who wanted to give me money. Unbound are great. They give you 50% of the money. Somebody on Twitter said to me, oh, God, they're really ripping you off. They keep half the money. It's like, you don't know what a royalty is, do you? <laughs> 50% is a bad royalty. But, yeah, and they were brilliant. And the book came out, and it got reviews, and it was in all the big shops. Didn't sell very well, but, as I said, it was a real – yeah, I mean, I recommend Unbound. Mm-hmm. Any crowdfunding like that, crowdfunding that's got distribution and publicity, mm-hmm. you know, because anybody can crowdfund a book and then you've got a box of books in your attic that you can give to your friends. <laughs> but if you've got a book that's actually going to be in Waterstones and is actually sent out for review, then all you have to do is the publicity. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. And your your latest book is Night Train, um, which, yes, which we've been reading. Uh, w- w- do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that was an idea I had in, I don't know, the noughties or something like that. And it was just this one idea of a person waking up in a really loud, dark room that was shaking violently and then discovering that they were on a moving train in a weird post-apocalyptic landscape. And then it's like, oh, now what? So she goes into the next carriage and, oh, it's full of corpses. 
So, okay, and just carry on from there, really. So it's weird because it's literally a compartmentalized book. Yeah. Every section takes place. It's like, oh, every time you write a chapter, it's like, opens the door, what's in here? Opens the door, what's in here? Opens the door, what's in here? In the last, in the last carriage, there was a man-eating bear with armor plates. Okay, got to up the ante now. Uh, <laughs> a chicken, no. <laughs> but it is a bit like that. There isn't a chicken, but there are some turtles. So, yeah, yeah that was a lot of fun to write. I have to say... Um... As someone who really knows your work from the, the thick of it and Veep, when I read Night Train, um, it was completely not what I was expecting at all. It was completely different, and uh, that was it was a nice kind of shock to 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 see that. And I mean, it must be quite fun to be able to, as you were saying earlier, to expand your kind of creative kind of output and just write in fantasy, horror, kind of comedy in completely different areas. And that, that must be quite a nice thing to do. It really is, especially after, you know, I mean, in, in terms of getting things on television, I'm definitely a failure because I've tried and tried. I used to try for years to try and get sitcoms made. And it's so soul destroying, you know, to just write a script, tout it around. I wrote a thing with Jane Bustman, who's a brilliant writer, and it was like BBC said, this is great. Write another script. We wrote another script. This is great. And for about two years, we were making a weird li subliminal living rewriting our scripts and writing new scripts and then they made a pilot and they liked it and then they said oh we don't like it now can you write another script and we gave up because it's just mm. a weird twilight ex and that's you know it the near top end the top end is getting a show made but we were doing quite well compared to a lot of people so to get away from the thing of a sitcom was a real thing because you know night train would be a terrible sitcom <laughs> Do a carriage per episode or something like a that. A carriage per episode, each one with a sofa in it and two lads <laughs> yeah. desperately trying to get a girlfriend who would need an armor plate bed. And oh, what, what is your, um, what you know, does your writing process differ for your novels as opposed to the other type of writing that you do? Do, do you, obviously, it's more when you're writing a novel, it is you as opposed to working with other writers but apart from that you know do you spend a lot of time planning your story or do you have an idea and just sort of go at it and see where it goes it's more the latter for years with novels i i'd read that graham green used to plan his chapters down to the last detail and i used to try and do that but i get I have attention span issues, so I write a bit. It's like, oh, I'm going to write the chapter now. It's like, oh, I've written the synopsis. I know what I don't care yeah. mm -hmm. because you have to surprise yourself. So when I write film scripts, it's like you put together, you know, you put together the synopsis. I'm doing something at the moment with someone. You write a synopsis, you send it to the producers. They go through it. They make suggestions. So you write about five beat sheets. You know, you write a 10-page document, which has got every beat of the film in it. Yeah. So when it comes to writing the film, you know, you've got all the ribs on the rib cage, as it were, all the bones in the skeleton. And the fun is putting the jokes in, you know, putting all the character stuff <clears throat> and seeing the twists and turns happen. Mm -hmm. When I write a book, I tried to write like that, but it didn't work. Now I write like a, a really slender synopsis and ignore it. No, but it's like, so when I wrote Night Train, I had a structure, but it wasn't very detailed. A lot of the time I just... You know, I, there was nothing there. Um, because when you surprise yourself, you surprise other people. Because I noticed that with all my colours, a lot of people, whether they liked it or not, were surprised by the ending. Mm -hmm. And that's because I had no idea what I was going to write. When I sat down and had to write it for the start of the book, all right, I'll, my big cliche here is, if you, do you know the film Something Wild by Jonathan Demme? I don't know. No, I don't think so. I love that film because it's got something that I've stolen as an idea, which goes, the film starts off, it's basically a bit of a cliche. It's a young, uptight lawyer guy in New York walks into a young, crazy, cute girl who's something wild. And, you know, they start hanging out and you think, oh, okay, it's one of those. It's like, will he go back to his wife? Will they have an affair? You know, she's fun and crazy. He's kind of a bit staid. And then she says, will you come with me to my high school reunion, to my town? And it's like, oh, OK, why not? And then on the way, she says, can you tell my parents that you're my fiance? And he's like, what the hell? It's crazy enough already. And you think, oh, I know where this is going. And then they go to a high school reunion. And then 
Ray Liotta turns up, who from Goodfellas, he's her ex-boyfriend. He hasn't got over her, and he's going to kill her fiance. <laughs> and it totally turns into this absolutely fucking terrifying film. <laughs> you know, it's really worth seeing. And yeah. that, to me, is how you write a story. Mm-hmm. Instead of doing the usual thing, you know, blah, 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 develop act, act two is the development of act one. Yeah. Act, at the end of act one, everyone is killed, and the dog tells a story. At the end of act one, it turns out they're fish, whatever. Mm-hmm. And if you can keep, that's for me is why it's good to not over plan. Because if you can keep throwing, I hate the word, but you know, curveballs, just doing mad stuff. It's like a great example is the start of Up. You know, it's like, yeah. this is a little cartoon about these two people getting older together. And then suddenly she dies. You're like, oh, now what are they going to do for the next 90 minutes? Yeah. And that's why it's incredibly moving. Because A, it's moving. And B, it's an absolute punch in the stomach, which you are not expecting. And, you know. So when you when you're you know I mean I think that's a really great idea and that 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 idea of um, not planning too far ahead because you want to surprise yourself surprise the readers, but how do you how do you how does that work in reality? Do you do you write a chunk and then let it sit and then see what happens next and then go into it again or do you or do you structure it a little bit more than that? It's it totally depends. There's a famous quote about. Writing a novel is like driving from London to Edinburgh. You know, you know some of the towns on the way. You know that you might drop off and have lunch, but you basically have no idea. Mm-hmm. So I'd, you do a bit of that. You throw some stepping stones out and hope for the best and some things you plan. But what I like is when there's room for the – when you're out walking the dog and you suddenly thought – and you suddenly think of something like, but what if it's not a cake? Or, but what if – he turns out to be so and so. You know, yeah. you have an and again. It's as I say, it's the idea thing. You have an idea and you test it. And I annoy myself because sometimes I be walking the door and I'll be going, "Oh my god, that's brilliant!" Like a wanker. <laughs> <laughs> if you can make yourself think that. No, but I, I think I mean that's that's part of the yeah part of the enjoyment of writing. I find is is exactly that that sort of moment or or when your characters say something that you that you didn't expect yourself almost you know you're you, you're sort of um yeah you're going in unexpected directions that and i think when that happens that means that you're really invested in the story and that it's much better writing than as you say if you've planned out every single you know, yeah. beat of the story it, it it comes across i think sometimes you can read you know we've all read novels where you can say this has been so structured that it's actually quite boring yeah there's there's a writer called jonathan carroll who i only discovered because somebody said one of my books was like his so i read one and there's a book he said he'd been trying to write conventional novels for years and it just wasn't clicking for him. And he was writing a new book called The Land of Laughs, and it was quite conventional. And he said it was all going fine until suddenly there was a dog in it, and suddenly the dog spoke. <laughs> and he was just like, okay, this... And he just knew he was on the right lines. Yeah. And he became a writer, not except entirely, but of basically semi-fantastic novels in a kind of Murakami style. Mm-hmm. And that's an example of, you know, that's an unplanned moment. Nobody mm-hmm. sits down writing a story like that and things, and then the dog says... And when I read the book, I was unaware of this, and it ab- I'd ruined it for you, but it absolutely <laughs> just drew me up. I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. You know, and when you have to go back and read the line again or rewind the scene, you know, that's a great moment. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, and I was saying that, sorry, saying that, I still don't like the thing where people suddenly go, oh, the character took over. It's like, that's not good mm-hmm. because you should still be, you know, you should get them in your office and have a work review. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, no, I, w- I was just going to say, um, w- when you've, w- when you're r- writing, I mean, do you do one full draft of the novel, or do you do you revise as you go, or do you like to try and get the whole thing out and then sit back and look at it and then r- redraft it at that point? I honestly tend to write it without looking and then send it off to someone. Mm-hmm. I do read it again and I do try and get someone to read it, but. I was reading about Edna O'Brien and she used to write it and then send, not read it, send it off. And then the editor would come back. And I sort of do that basically. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you, you, with books, your agent is an editor. 
yeah. with TV, the producer or the showrunner is an editor. There's always some. So if you write something that you like, and I'm quite a sloppy writer in a sense that I'd rather like bash it out and get it out there. Mm-hmm. I'm not really a kind of perfectly honed sentence. Mm-hmm. Probably because of the background with with writing fast and television as well. Generally, I write the sentence that I want to write, or the line of dialogue. You know, um, I think coming from telly that really helps. You're used to working with dialogue, so you're used to getting things in. This is a sideline thing, but you see a sitcom. Sometimes the line is just a beautiful quote, and it doesn't fit. There was a thing in Frasier where they'd all have these wonderful witty lines and it worked, except they'd give the dad one. It's like, mate, he's a retired cop. <laughs> and he'd be saying, he's like, there's only one thing worse than whatever. It's like, he's... so yeah, rambling. But, but yes, the answer is generally I write it. I might have another reread of it, but I can't stand it. It's, I just get, Ugh. yeah. So I send it off. And generally, if someone likes it, somebody will comment on it. So if you read Night Train or All My Colors, it's been gone through at least twice with an editor. Mm-hmm. The editor on Night Train is a woman called Kat Camacho, and she is so good that she actually wrote for herself a plan of the carriages. Oh, she wow. actually wrote buffet, you know, lounge, monster, turtles, buffet, because she wanted to get it right in her head. And I'm like, okay, this is really interesting, because I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it sounds from everything that you've said so far, writer's block is not a thing I can imagine you suffer from, because it sounds like you've got so many ideas exploding out of, of, of your brain but is that ever something that you've ever happened that kind of period of crap i literally don't know what i'm gonna write next um yeah i mean the way i try and get around it is by doing something else as we said but the only time i really get it is with the if i'm trying to force an idea like if i'm trying to write a comedy i think i'm just not a tv writer because if i try and write a sitcom idea i can't do it and with the short stories because i'm trying to write one publish one every month sometimes that's a bit tricky. So sometimes I might write two the next month to catch up. Mm. But I don't, I don't think writer's block is real. I think writer's block is something that people have got who are wrong. Sorry, I'm trying to think of to say it's not spectacularly effective. I don't understand. <laughs> if it's your job, I don't understand writer's block. There's no such thing as doctor's block. You know, and there's no such thing as bus driver's block. And writing is just a thing that you do. And if you do have writer's block, just write something. Right, literally pick up a piece of paper or open the computer and write the first thing that comes into yeah. your head. Mm-hmm. Or go on Twitter. I find Twitter very dangerous, but it's a great place for testing jokes out. I, I mean, I suppose that's right. It, it's, you can have you can have bad days or good days, but as long as you're still writing, then you'll you'll get through it. I suppose. Um, what, what you you said you're working on Avenue Five. Have you got any other projects lined up at the moment? I'm writing a script um, unpaid for someone at the moment. I finished writing a script for a company who were supposed to be filming it um, quite soon, <clears throat> but that's probably not going to happen at the moment. And I've got two book ideas that I'm going to write soon, but I want to have a rest because I've written a lot of book stuff. And sorry about that. And I'm probably going to review some records for Record Collector. Cool. Nice. And I have to ask it because I can see it in the background, I think. Is that the Emmy that you won on? Oh, me? that whole thing. <laughs> yeah. It's really great because everybody on Veep got an Emmy. Uh, most people brilliant. on Veep got like 98 Emmys. It's brilliant. Um, you go along, you go to America. I went with my wife. You stay in a nice hotel. You go to the ceremony and see all, and it's really nice because you get to the event and it's like, oh, there's Ricky Gervais. Oh, there's James Corden. Well, that was worth coming all the way to America for. <laughs> and you sit in the event and we were in the back row, Amanda and I were in the front, and we won. It's like run down the front, shake hands with Mel Brooks, who's giving us the award, go to the party. And at the party, we've all got our Emmys. There's a big shelf of them. And we go to the party and there's like a heel bar. And you go up and they say, what have you won? And you tell them your name. And they print out a plastic strip, which they then stick on with two little bits here and give to you. It's absolutely bizarre. And underneath it says something like, the Emmy is the statue, it's the property of the Academy. If the recipient proposes to sell it, they have to return it to the Academy. So it's not actually mine. All right. Wow. It sort of belongs to the Emmy Academy. <laughs> which is fair enough. And my main worry was that it was going to fall off and impale my children. But yeah. <laughs> when also, you go to the party... Nice. 
Sorry. When you when you go to to the party with the Emmy, is there a place that you can securely leave your Emmy that won't get stolen, or do you carry it with you the whole party? You carry it with you, and it's quite interesting because people just come up to you because all the people who haven't won one, who were there obviously wanted to win one, they're like, oh, you know, can I? Literally, people want to pose for photos with it. <laughs> it's brilliant. But the best thing was that because Veep had won that year and won a couple of things, and there's so many people on Veep. There was a table and there's a photo and it's like 20 Emmys on it. And it's just a nice moment because it really is fuck off other programs that didn't <laughs> win. We are the best. <laughs> but yeah, most of my colleagues have got about nine of the things. I've just got one. Um, but it makes me very happy, as you can tell. Uh, what was the last film that you saw oh god it's on the tip of my brain the last film i saw was the vast of space is it called that, is that one? it's that. on amazon or netflix it's really good it's a little indie film about two people coming across alien transmissions in 1950s america oh that sounds good cool we I just thought that, we... yeah. uh, it's, it's it's astonishing it's a new director unknown cast it's one of those ones again where you're watching and you're going okay oh i know what <laughs> yeah that's, that's so really good. Uh, and what was the last book you read? The last book I read, oh, I can't believe I forgot. I'm, the last book I finished, let's say Behind Her Eyes by Sarah Pinborough. Oh, right. oh yeah, what were your thoughts? Really good. I, I hadn't read a lot of her stuff before or any of her stuff. But again, that's a book where you're like, oh, again, it's the classic, I know where this is going, what the yeah. fuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Very it's definitely. Read it. no, no. What, in fact, we spoke to Sarah, and I think they they marketed that book as, or they called it in the office yeah. the "What the Fuck" book. Basically, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I remember reading, reading that book, and the twist at the end, you kind of think it is it's impossible to see coming. But then, as you can go back through it, and you think actually it's all there. You just there's just no way for you to realize what's happening. It but is, it's it's interesting because it requires to not get it requires the reader to do the thing of just going, oh, "I'm going to ignore that." So many mm-hmm. things keep happening in the book. You're like, oh, so I'll just, well, so so just floated around the room. I'm just going to ignore that. Yeah. It's like, you shouldn't have ignored it. It's a plot point. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I read her because she'd got a copy of Night Train. So yeah, it's a really great book. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to get more of her stuff, but I think it's all, she's got another one coming out and I think it's all being held back or something. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. Although I think it's out soon. Um, I think it's out in America, but not out in the UK yeah, yet. Oh, uh, right. Um, the last TV series that you watched or the show that you're watching at the moment? Last TV, sh- right, I'm going to lie, because it's more, in- last TV series I watched was called The King, Eternal Monarch, which is a K-drama. I wrote, I wrote a novel set in Korea, which I'm still trying to get published, which is about a North Korean girl who accidentally finds herself transferred to South Korea as part of a, in a K-pop right. academy okay. with a science, you know, that old one. Um, <laughs> so, but me and my wife started watching K-dramas and absolutely fucking love them. They're astonishing. They're like really high production values. They've got bits of myths and legends in them. Mm-hmm. They're really funny, really violent. There's a lot rom- romantic comedies. And the King Eternal Monarch is basically parallel universe, romantic political comedy. It's insane. And it's a, it's brilliant. All uh, K dramas. There's a, there's a, a production duo called the Hong sisters and you should just Google them. Their stuff is astonishing. So yeah, I recommend that. What's that? What's awesome. that on Netflix? That's or? on probably a lot of K dramas on Netflix. Right. Okay. Well, worth checking out. Cool. Brilliant. Um, and the very final thing we do is a quick fire, either or. So uh, two options, no correct answer for most of them. Um, first one: Malcolm Tucker or Selena Myers. Um, Selena. <laughs> um, horror or sci-fi? Sci-fi. <clears throat> Real book or ebook? Real book. Oh. Nobody always ever dis- picks ebook. Tarek's always oh, disappointed. He wouldn't admit to it. It's, <laughs> like, it's like farting in the shower versus eating tofu. <laughs> nobody, nobody does the second one. Everyone does the first one, but no one's going to admit it. If they're not listening. <laughs> Well, 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Uh, I certainly did. I thought, yeah, definitely. Uh, I thought it was really interesting what he was saying about how you can sort of train yourself to to come up with ideas or recognise when an idea is is worthy of further exploration, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that is something that isn't obvious maybe to people who are sort of starting out in writing, you know, um, that you do have to make an effort you know, you can't just wait to be struck by inspiration with some sort of blindingly yeah. great idea. Um, you can explore ideas that come and see if see if they do end up as something that that can go somewhere. I mean, as his basically rant against Star Wars has now <laughs> has now made a legendary uh, appearance in the thick of it. And actually, I'll put a clip. I'll put a link to the that that clip yeah, from definitely. the thick of it because it is definitely worth watching. Clip. I mean, the whole and of I the thick of it's worth watching, to be honest. He is he is right though. I think there is definitely you probably it's probably true as you say that it's maybe folks starting off, but there is a kind of image that inspiration just pops in your head, and you know, always have a notebook for when that idea pops in your head and write it down. And that is there's an element of truth to that, but I think a lot of it is most ideas that people get are kind of crap, and they need a lot of work to make them into really good ideas, and it's. Yeah, you do need to to, uh, uh, to know how to change them and what to add and take away from. Yeah, the like he thought. said, it's sort of pattern recognition of saying, yeah, "Is this yeah. a good idea? Could this go somewhere?" And also, it was interesting that what he was saying about like if you get an idea, don't try and force it necessarily into the thing you're working on at the time. If it doesn't fit, you can use it for something else. So yeah. an idea or writes. a joke or something like that. Yeah, I mean, he's he's written. We see one short story a month he puts yeah. out on his on his website, and you know that's a great way to if, if you have got too many ideas in your head or you worry it's growing too big, chop some of it off, turn it into its own work, and put it out there. You mm-hmm. know, it's, so it's plenty of avenues now to put stuff out. So thanks very much to David for taking the time to speak to us. We really enjoyed that, and we really yeah. enjoyed seeing the Emmy as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was, I've never seen one before. Uh, well. Have I seen one before? I've seen it on the TV. Still not releasing one before, have I? I mean, I suppose we kind of saw it on the the TV as well. (laughs) 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 On on our computer screens. But it seemed more real. Exactly, it did seem more real. Um, So, yeah, we're we're one step closer to 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 getting that Emmy. That's that's it. Um, No, yeah, so seriously, thanks to David for taking that time. Uh, We've got another great guest next week. We do indeed. Uh, Next week we are chatting with Paul Tremblay, who is a horror author. Uh, he's had some fantastic pieces of work out in the past, including A Head Full of Ghosts, and his latest uh, book is Survivor Song, which is about a pandemic of sorts which breaks out. So, a timely release. Uh, yeah. One of those unfortunate coincidences that seems to happen. But it, no, it's really it's really worth picking up. It's got quite a bit of buzz about it, the, the book at the moment. and It's a great read. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. it's definitely worth picking up. Um, just giving you that. The, the opening, I thought, was just really good at building up a very quick sense of dread you yeah. know it's which a really hot it's a really great gripping opening isn't yeah. It? yeah yeah so uh, definitely tune in for that one and you'll you'll hear him talking about that and where that idea came from and how how he went about writing it um but i think that's about enough from us uh, as always if you enjoyed the episode please do take a couple of seconds just to give us a rating on apple podcasts and leave a review if you've got time that would be amazing and really helps us climb the rankings and of course, if you'd like to get in touch, you can always do so by sending us a tweet to at right underscore gear or send us an email to podcast at rightgear.co.uk. And uh, the only other thing I want to mention this week is that we do have our other sort of side project, which is the Page One Sessions, which was sort of a video panel discussion that we had with some guests that we've had on the podcast before. The first of those is up now. It's uh, Sarah Pimber and Tim Levin having a chat about trying to be creative during a pandemic and much more besides that we hear about what they've been working on and what what's coming up for them Uh, so it's definitely worth checking out that's on our youtube channel and i've put a link in the podcast description so you can check that out as well well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Mm-hmm.